money. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when I say the word? Is it Jeff Bezos at the Met Gala? Is it something expensive? Perhaps a holiday on the Amalfi Coast? Or is it what you do with it? Pay off your debts? <laughs> Pay off your parents' mortgage? Maybe even buying a car? Or is it simply just pay rent on time? Money buys things. And by the looks of the expressions on all of your faces, we all love buying our way out of things. So money solves things and it provides outcomes to problems, which is good. Because the first thing I think of when someone says the word money is a roof over the head of every single human being on the planet. What if I showed you all that money can do the things that we all want and think of when we say the word, but it can also do more? What if I said that money can change the world for the better? That money can be a force for good. Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, and everyone in between. My name is Arjun Agarwal, and I've engineered investing to change the world. I'm a 25-year-old ex-investment banker. And I was expecting some who's and ours, but anyway. <laughs> Key operative word, X was in the past, no longer. I've worked across three continents and helped close over half a billion dollars in deal flow. I've raised $30 million for investment in other businesses, and I run an impact investing fintech called Inam. These credentials helped me get in the room today, and they also allow me to share with you my first-hand account of why money is broken and how together we can fix it. Money is not the root of all evil. It doesn't just add people to the Forbes billionaires list or go to places where it shouldn't. Whilst it may seem like it, here is why money itself is not evil. Time for a little story. My father was one of South Africa's leading entrepreneurs in the pharmaceutical industry. While he was great at business, unfortunately, he wasn't at good, as good at managing his own personal money. People took advantage of this. He ended up making some poor investments that cost him his entire life savings in the millions. Five years later, he lost his life. Not knowing how or where to invest money or understanding how money worked cost us everything. As a young person who now had to take care of his mother, I found myself in the same position. I didn't know how or where to invest my money, nor did I understand how money worked. All I knew was that I could not let any other family go through this ever again. And I've dedicated my life to ensuring that this doesn't happen to anyone else. And so I began my quest to understand money. And what a journey that's been. If you haven't figured it out already from my sexy accent, <laughs> I'm from South Africa. That's where I grew up, which is one of the world's most beautiful countries. But it is also one of the world's worst countries when it comes to the wealth gap. I was privileged and grew up in a gated community. However, that led me to believe everyone lived the same life I did. As I grew older, I had the opportunity to step out from behind those gates, and what I saw has defined all that I've done since. I very quickly realized that the only difference between myself and someone living in a squatter camp was the balance in our bank accounts. The difference was money. Now, of course, cyclical factors such as poverty, crime, education, and access to healthcare were all part of the problem, but they were all sewn together by one common thread, money, or in this case, the extreme absence of it. I'm going to split the rest of this story into two parts, Beta Arch and MVP Arch, which was the minimum viable product of myself after I had my first experience of money being used as a force for good. 
And a series of experiences led me to my epiphany moment, or what venture capitalists would like to call product market fit. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. I think you can tell I'm into startups. More on that later. Bedage, balling, courtesy of Pops, is very grateful for mom and papa's teachings. They instilled in me the foundations of service that I continue building my life on today. I spent a lot of my time outside of my academic and professional commitments giving back to the community. Here I was lucky enough to work with Africa Tikkun, an organization that takes care of young children from poor circumstances from the time they're born until the time they're placed into a job to empower an entire generation of people who were previously disadvantaged due to ongoing wealth inequality and uh, the remnants of apartheid policies. Their unique model, which essentially attracts a significant portion of the entire corporate South African philanthropy budget and essentially builds the future corporate workforce, redirected $20 million in 2020 alone. A pretty decent outcome achieved by redirecting the flow of money and using it as a force for good. MVP Arj, not bowling and trying very hard not to get evicted, saw what money could do even when you didn't have much of it. After we lost everything, dad had to spend a lot of his time on the road, making sales, meeting people to put food on the table. One practice he never let go of, regardless of his financial situation, was ensuring that if he ever came across any homeless people on the way home, he'd offer them a loaf of bread, some milk, or anything else they needed to not go to bed hungry, independent of whether he had millions in his account or just 10 bucks. If he had to use his sales money to do so, he would, because he knew how hard it was to earn that bread, quite literally. And that's part two of how even when you don't have much money, you can redirect its flow and use it as a force for good. My experiences led me to an inkling that money was made unnecessarily complex. At its core, it was as simple as money goes in and money goes out. But the financial services industry the system that manages money did a great job of introducing barriers and veils to make the access to and understanding of money difficult for ordinary people. This is why I got into investment banking. I thought to myself, what better place to learn about money than the place where it was invented, is used, stored and transferred? Banks. So I fought my way in and in doing so, learned everything I needed to to break down those barriers and clear up all that opaqueness. Because, duh, why else would you want to get into investment banking? <laughs> Turns out, I wasn't all that wrong. It really was as simple as money goes in, money goes out. It's just guided by complicated words that define how it goes in or how it goes out. It's easy to think of money as a tool a tool to get things done. You can use a hammer to put things together, or you can use it to completely break things apart. How you choose to use it is your decision entirely. Similarly, money can be used to bring about positive outcomes for everyone, or it can continue supporting the systemic cycle of bringing about positive outcomes to a few people at the cost of many. Contrary to popular belief, the choice remains with us. Money can be a force for good. It is my firm belief that it can. My plan, my big picture of how we can redirect and reallocate the global flow of capital and create a force for good is called impact investing. Impact investing means investing, or money going in, to places that positively impact people, planet, and profit. Translated, that's redirecting the global flow of capital and using it as a force for good. Where does the money go out? In places that need it the most. To give you some numbers, the global financial services or investment market, which is a very clouded place to navigate because everyone measures things differently, is valued at $126 trillion. 
and in some instances, upwards of $200 trillion. That's 800 Elon Musk. <laughs> I can't even begin to comprehend the number of zeros there, and we don't have to. Proportions are far better understood. To put that into context, the global impact financial services market is valued at $1 trillion. Impact sits well below 1%. Why is this? Because there is a clear misalignment of incentives. Financial services make money off of money. This means their interests line providing you a product or service that earns them the highest revenue or commission. Not something that aligns to your goals as an individual. But money should work for those it was intended to serve, not those that amass the most control of it. Think of it as a cycle. Let's see where the money currently goes, how it gets there and why, and work our way backwards to understand how we can get it to go where it can make a difference. Say someone starts a business. They're a startup. They do well. They become a scale-up. They perform. They do better. They reach maturity and eventually exit and or continue. At every stage of growth, the business requires capital or money to go in in order to support it to succeed. At various stages of growth, investors range from angels to venture capitalists, private equity funds, and listed markets or stock exchanges. The exit is where the money goes out. Where the money goes and to who is a function of why that business was started. To make the founders wealthy or to solve a problem for their customers. The choice of which companies get the money going in at every stage of the game lies with us, investors, the end consumer. You being a customer indirectly makes you an investor in any given business. Bear with me. Investors invest in businesses with paying customers. Businesses with customers tend to succeed and provide a positive return on investment. Paying customers make investors believe the business is thriving, and so they continue investing. Remember I started the talk with money buys things? We've all just been buying things without paying much attention to where the money goes in and where it goes out. We're all part of the problem that we didn't know existed. We're unconsciously choosing exactly where the money will go in and exactly where it will go out. This cycle must be re-engineered. And here is why we need to do that piece of engineering together. So that we can amplify the surface area for impact and create a force for good. The current size of the Australian population is 26 million humans. 45% or nearly half of them are aged 20, 34 and younger. The trend suggests a shift from this majority usually being people aged above 35 years. What we're seeing is a clear transition of the majority of the population becoming young people. My team and I have had the opportunity to speak to over 500 such young people. And here's what they had to say. These were all 18 to 30 year old socially aware young Australians. 82% of them said that they wanted to learn more about how or where to invest their money. A whopping 93% said that the impact their money made mattered to them. Without the knowledge of how or where, we risk propagating cycles of poverty, abuse, crime, and in a doomsday scenario, access to capital for public markets from this new majority. What does this mean? This means that businesses, economies, governments, politicians, and political systems must become aligned to start serving the needs of the new majority, to start catering to the new majority, which is us, the millennials, the Gen Zs, the Gen Alphas. And whilst I've shared the trend in Australia, this is something we can see happening the world over. What we're seeing is change is necessary. Young people now want to drive change. Young people now have the power to drive change and young people now have the capital to drive change.
So if we as a collective started becoming customers and investors in businesses that positively impact people, planet and profit, in other words, businesses doing good things, they will start attracting capital from every stage of the investment journey, of the business journey, which ultimately helps us turn money into a force for good. Making you, each and every single person in a seat here tonight, the catalyst for reallocating and redirecting the global flow of capital into impact. If there was a singular point in history where we could shift the needle in the right direction, it is now. Changing the world isn't hard. It's getting people to believe that they can do it, which is. So here's how you can contribute to making money a force for good. Define what impact means to you. Is it well-being? Is it climate? Is it sustainability or is it empowerment? Ask questions. Before you become a customer or you, be, or you invest in a business, ask yourself, is this impactful or is it greenwashing? Use a tool like the Impact Management Project to do so. Use your voice. Get your friends behind something. Get your community behind something you believe in. Advocacy by the people is the most underrated social license. Call out the BS. Don't be polite. Hold people accountable to their actions and their promises. Start the conversation wherever you can. And choose what's right. If it doesn't feel right, it probably isn't. Lastly, invest in startups. Arguably some of the world's most impactful businesses. Startups tend to be solving the world's most pressing problems. Last year in Australia, startup investments reached an all-time record high of $10 billion. But less than 0.03% went to women of color. To give you some perspective, less than 0.03%. Serena Williams recently shared that globally out of all startup investments, only 2% went to women. This doesn't even begin to highlight intersectionalities such as the queer, gender diverse, neurodiverse, culturally and linguistically diverse people. Places where money should be going in, places where we should be buying but aren't because they never get that far, because they're never invested into. We all know money is a force. It's about time it became a force for good. It is my firm belief that we can in fact redirect the global flow of capital and create a force for good. Change is a choice. The decision to make that choice is yours. Thank you very much for listening to my <laughs>